Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 123 of the American Muslim Experience. I am your host, Pervez Ahmed, and I am joined by our co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum, Pervez. Assalamu alaikum, listeners. I hope everybody is doing well, enjoying their summer. Pervez, how are you? Yeah, yeah, it's been a great summer um, so far, and uh, uh, well, I mean, we're at the tail end of it, it seems, because we're already at the end of July, and then before we know it, it's going to be August, and then schools start up, what, second week of August, pretty much. That's right, we were talking about that the other day, we were talking about how, like, school, didn't August used to be part of summer, and, and now it's really not, but I don't know. On one hand, I'm kind of looking forward to the routine, right? But uh, that's right, that's right. Um, I mean, yeah. for, we have to go to work either way, whether it's <laughs> summer or not. So <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, we, and we are uh, uh, at the cusp of our uh, trip to Michigan for our niece's wedding, and Walima. We were looking forward to that, and so. Uh, but I bet, I bet by the time the episode actually hits. Um, that would have already happened or it'll be in the midst of it. So anyway, um, we're always excited back, excited to be back with our listeners and, um, um, wanted to share kind of a few things, a couple of things that were, uh, you know, less than sort of happy or joyful news. Um, you know, one was, um, I think for some of our listeners, you may have seen, um, things online or in the news about, um, Asim Ghafoor, who is a, a U.S. American citizen, an attorney, uh, former attorney of the um, Jamal Khashoggi family, uh, who has been detained by the Emiratis, the UAE. Um, there's yeah. a lot of sort of ambiguity there around the, the exact um, circumstances of the uh, of the detention and the arrest. But um, where 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 it matters to us, of course, or what I mean, obviously, it matters to us just because he's Muslim and he's an American citizen. But it hits close to home because uh, he's a cousin of both of ours. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've said it. A lot on the show, Pervez and I are cousins, and this is also a mutual cousin. Right. Um, so this is a couple of weeks ago. He was detained uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi, the, and the key thing is no charges were. Uh, he wasn't. He wasn't given any notice of any charges against him. So he was, just, he was just basically detained, kind of as as a surprise on his way to Istanbul, and and apparently he was even convicted based on a trial that in absentia in absentia a, he didn't mm-hmm. he didn't know about it he didn't attend it it was just like a shock right mm-hmm. um and without getting into onto the political side of things yeah uh we do know that he was the former lawyer of jamal khashoggi who of course um was we, know, ju- we know the journalist who yeah. was killed so there's a lot going on here but first and foremost we're just both concerned about our, our cousin yeah um he's 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 Perez especially um, grew up with him in Texas. I, we also lived, my family also lived in Texas and mm-hmm. we just became, uh, even closer, you know, obviously re- related as well, but right. this is like a staple of our childhood. Staple, yeah. And a fixture of fi- our childhood. Yeah. yeah, fixture, yeah. Exactly. yeah no, no, no. Uh, and, uh, someone who I have I sort of had on the back of my mind to always sort of have on the show. Cause I think he has a lot of insight. So mm-hmm. inshallah, we can one day still do that. Um, but, um, uh, I guess if you if you don't mind, I guess sharing some things that people can do if they're interested in yeah. getting involved. Yeah, I mean, we do urge you to first yeah. of all take, do do act do 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 get involved because if if you know Awesome and he's very well connected throughout the U.S. I mean, the guy's clean as a whistle. This is yeah. clearly like not legit charges yeah. or anything like that. So just want to put that out there first Correct. and foremost. Right. Uh, in order to get involved, learn a little more, um, and and actually be able to get some guidance on what action to take. Please join the Facebook group. It's hashtag free awesome now, F R E E A S I M N O W. Um, and they're going to be providing whatever updates they can um, about his well being, but also about what you can do to just help him, inshallah, get, get back home um, quickly help with health. Uh, so they're going to give you information about templates to use to contact state representatives. Uh, how to, in the most in the most eff- effective way, demand his release from the prison, um, and ultimately help him come home. And so they're you know they're obviously weighing what to say, who to say it to. Right. Um, and but so again, go to the Facebook group right. and you'll get the, all the updates. Right, because it's about being strategic, you know, at this point. And uh, you know, um, and for listeners of the show, I mean, you know, a few months ago, or uh, you know, it's been probably a little over a year now, we had Mustafa Tamiz on the show, who is actually Asim Wolfur's brother-in-law. So um, anyway, um, yeah, someone very near and dear to all of us. And uh, as I imagine, there, there are listeners out there who know him or know of him, because like Omar mentioned, Asim is is super connected has been heavily involved um you know in the muslim community for decades decades and, and even as you were telling me that even in just kind of the last couple of weeks here 
just talking to people about it, you're you're realizing how connected he is. You're realizing, oh, you know, awesome too. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. related to awesome. I I'd found out that my second cousin is also <laughs> his second cousin. So like a, a, a cousin of mine on a completely different side. That's right. Is actually related to him. Yeah, she, she's been involved, and then. People in the Bay I have Area. a lawyer buddy, right? Yeah, I have a lawyer buddy in the Bay Area who was like, "Wait a minute, you know, Awesome and I were neighbors for ten years in Jeddah, you know, when we grew up together." So, you know, just fascinating, like all these, you know. But yeah, Awesome is that kind of guy. He he just knows a lot of people, and you know, it's a baraka, but it's also you know um, because of the fact that he has been so active in the Muslim community. So, uh, anyway, a lot of uh, a lot of our elected officials have already tweeted about this. Have already you know shared um, their concerns on social media. We we can be strategic. Um, that Facebook resource that Omar shared is an excellent resource because we're, you know, folks are sharing templates, um, you know, who to contact, how to, and, you know, the frequency, the cadence, etc. So, yeah. again, it's about being smart. It's about being effective, and you know, inshallah, you know, praying for his quick and speedy release, for justice to be done, and uh, because, like Omar mentioned, you know, tried in absentia, found guilty, and sentenced for three years in prison, plus you know, a multi-million dollar fine. So again, just completely a lack of due process there. But yeah. so. so again, Facebook yeah. group yeah. is free. Awesome. Now awesome is one a S I M. And so free. Awesome. Now, uh, please do join the group and uh, you'll get updates there. That's right. Um, and then just something else I, I was sort of from, you know, felt, feel compelled to share because um, while, you know, I only met him once and don't know him, didn't know him personally, not certainly a dear friend, but, you know, a very well-respected member of our community, um, a thought leader, a founder of a extremely influential organization, uh, Al-Maghrib Institute, uh, Muhammad al-Sharif uh, suddenly passed away in and actually Abu Dhabi, uh, in Dubai, excuse me. Um, and so where he was living for the last 10 years, um, I imagine, you know, I'd be surprised if any of our listeners didn't know at least about Al-Maghrib Institute. Uh, and so he was the founder of Al-Maghrib Institute. And, uh, you know, um, and like I said, I mean, I was never a sort of a patron um, or someone who attended Al-Maghrib Institute classes, but I certainly knew some of the faculty, some of the instructors. Um, and uh, from what I, and I, from my, my memory when I met him years ago, just a very sincere, very, um, very committed um, individual who really had a vision, uh, like a, I mean, a real vision to the, uh, sort of the kind of content that we, I think, today kind of take for granted, um, but that before Al-Maghrib sort of came to the scene um, really wasn't that prevalent. And so, you know, I think a lot of it can be attributed to Al-Maghrib, and that was the sort of singular vision of Muhammad al-Sharif. So for those who knew him in Medina, they, they sort of talk about, you know, him having this vision. He was a Canadian. He was a Canadian. He's, you know, he was born and raised in Canada. Um, he was very active in the Minna scene. I uh, actually know people who knew him very well in Minna um, back in Canada. So anyway, just a shock. Uh, again, a reminder that uh, life is so fragile. He was my age, I think exactly my age. So obviously it cl it's close to home um, and just no pre no you know, comorbidities, no sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, health issues that he knew, knew of. Um, he just collapsed and passed away. So, yeah, I think, I think people are super shocked again because yeah. he was so young. Right. right. <clears throat> I think 47 years 47 old. 47 years, that right? years old. That's my, yeah. yeah so, uh, I mean, I, I remember about 20 years ago, uh, I heard some, a friend of mine, uh, gave me some of the Sierra CDs yeah. and <laughs> he, so that must've been in his twenties and it, it, it did not come it did not come across like this was somebody who's who was in his twenties. So so when I and I hadn't heard of, heard his content in in many years, but when I found out he was only forty seven today, yeah. that, that was actually the the big shock. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, inna lillahi wa inna We pray for his maqra. We pray for his you know his uh, that Allah blesses him, um, and you know gives him the highest elevated place in uh, in Jannah and paradise. I mean, um, so, so yeah, uh, now I guess, uh, sorry, uh, it's an awkward transition, but we are very excited about, um, our guest today, someone who's been on our bucket list, collective bucket list for quite some time. Um, and so Omar, why don't you tell us a little bit about who we have today? Yeah, Our guest is none other than Michael Wolf. Uh, Michael Wolf, you may have all, all heard of from his, of course, his famous, uh, ABC news nightline special in 1997 is when, Many of us heard of him for the first time, but uh, a little background on him. He, Michael is an American poet. He's an author, and he's president and co-executive producer of 
Unity Productions Foundation. That's UPF. Uh, you'll hear all about his, uh, his, his youth, but he was born in Cincinnati uh, to a Christian mother, a Jewish father. He converted to Islam at age 40. And of course, he's been a frequent lecturer uh, at various top-notch universities. And he holds a degree in classics from Wellesleyan University. He's published several books, The Hajj, 1000 Roads to Mecca, uh, and of course, Unity Productions. You've you've definitely seen some of their content Prolific. on PBS. Uh, the the first the big one, of course, where they came on the scene was Muhammad Legacy of a Prophet in two thousand two, but they've also done a bunch of other great content. Uh, Prince Among Slaves, Enemy of the Reich, The Sultan and the Saint, uh, Cities of Light, The Rise and Fall of Islamic Spain, and so and the list goes on and on. Just recently, of course, um, they put out the great muslim american road trip we had our last show yeah our last show we had uh, mona and mona mona heather and uh, sebastian uh <laughs> mona and sebastian mona and sebastian <laughs> yeah so we'll, we'll uh, yeah t- we'll definitely you know give them another plug go check out that episode episode one that two, series two. has wrapped yeah it's and it's, it's wonderful show. Yeah, mm-hmm. and yeah we were delighted and and uh, i'll be i mean i just want to share something i mean you know it was actually through um, our promoting that last episode that, you know, Michael reached out because, you know, Michael had heard the episode and he was very gracious in his praise about how he, how he thought we did in terms of, uh, you know, interviewing, um, Sebastian and, and Mona and engaging them. So we were deeply honored, obviously, you know, humbly, you know, humbled and honored, uh, by the praise that Michael gave. And, um, and so I was like, we got to make this happen. And so, um, you know, and, uh, to add to that beautiful um, opportunity, you know, we had the good fortune of sitting with him right here in, in my living room. So, um, anyway, without further ado, welcome, Michael, to the show. So, welcome, uh, Michael, to the show. We are so delighted and honored to have you on the show. Um, thank you for making the trip. Uh, I know it was a little bit of a trek for you to come out here, but here we are uh, sitting together on a wonderful Thursday evening in Fremont. Uh, but yeah, we are absolutely delighted and honored to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be here. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. And yeah, 25 years uh, since I first heard your name. Um, I think I was mentioning just before the show, my I was taking a class at a Jesuit school and, and my college professor played your Nightline video, and that's when I first heard heard, heard your name, and of course, uh, you've been doing a lot of great work since, which, are, which we're, of course, going to get into, but uh, we, we, you know, we want to go all the way back. Yeah, I, I would say, like, I think for, would you, would you agree that probably for a lot of the American Muslim community, um, it was probably that Nightline episode where people came to know about you? Oh, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, there hadn't been any TV from Mecca. Uh, in America. Of course, you could watch it in Europe and you could watch it in Morocco, for instance. I remember watching a lot of Hajj television in Morocco yeah. many years before 1997, which was when that that documentary was made, but never anything in the U.S. The only thing, uh, as a kid who was kind of coming of age in the 90s, um, in 10th grade, in 1993, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and then yes. later that year, the book, the movie came out. Yes. And so, sitting in a theater and seeing Mecca in, in, in that movie, that was pretty Im- impactful for me as a 15, 16-year-old at the time. And then, of course, just a few years later, your Nightline uh, yeah. document, documentary came out, which was yeah. great. Yeah, I was very surprised that uh, anybody watched it, and it turned out that a lot of people watched it because it was you know, Ted Koppel and Nightline, and they had a special every other Friday night, I think it was. And this was one of those. So it was, it wasn't just a news report, it wound up being more or less half an hour. Mm -hmm. And and, and I know we'll get to this, but that wasn't the first time you performed the pilgrimage, right? No, no, I was there Mutawif. None of the, none of the crew had been to Mecca before. So they actually relied on me to, you know, figure out what to do next and right. where to go. As you know, it's a very big place. And there were a couple of times when we thought we were one place and we were another <laughs> um, uh, around the, the larger territory of Mecca. That was very exhilarating, very mm-hmm. fun. Uh, that's why I learned to make movies. I didn't learn to make a movie in college or in Hollywood or New York or anything. I, I honestly learned to make movies in Mecca from, you know, a few news guys who were our crew. Right. You know, and I think the reason, I I know it, I think 
the reason why a lot of people did see it, because if I recall, and of course we're talking about a pre-internet age, so to speak, where, you know, um, it wasn't, there was no social media to spread the word, but I know that there were area mosques and et cetera that, that had gotten word about it. There were, there were Muslim organizations that had heard about it. And so it was being promoted mm-hmm. um, because I remember distinctly watching it live as it aired yeah, and just my jaw dropping to the floor because, you know, this is 1997. You're right. We had seen, you know, uh, Hajj picturized or, or, you know, a film crew there with Spike Lee's movie, which was before, but nonetheless to have you on the roof of the Kaaba, uh, you know, um, and, and then where you, and then the documentary portion, but what really struck out to me, and I still remember very vividly is just the interview with Ted Koppel, that portion, as opposed to the, even in addition to the documentary. Yeah. That was live. Um, the That's rest right. of it was filmed That's right. um, as we went along, uh, but that was a live. See, that's what made it amazing because documentary is one thing, but um, but to actually see someone live and and be a satellite with Ted Koppel, that was amazing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, that's great. But we'll we'll dive yeah. into the into the catalog and all the <laughs> the productions and the and the and all the PBS shows and all that in just a bit. But we want to rewind yeah. as we like to do, Pervez, Right? We like to kind of go back in the time origin and story, yeah, as well. and capture the origin story. And uh, we like to really go back as as far back as your early youth and just hear where where your family's from and what it was like growing up uh, in the U.S. and what your experience was. Sure. Uh, so I'm an Ohio boy. I was born and raised in a small town north of Cincinnati, about 20, 25 miles. Uh, my dad was from the northern part of the state, and my mom was, uh, although I didn't know it then, we didn't grow up knowing this, but my mom's family, the Fosdicks, which that was her maiden name, um, went back about 400 years to the founding of Boston and Charlestown. Wow. So uh, my eighth or ninth great grandfather was a carpenter who was much in demand, you know, because they needed roofs over their heads in the cold New England winters. Um, And that's a whole story, which I only learned uh, 10 or so, 15 years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying now to write a book about not about that so much as about being an American Muslim and having part of my family go that far back. Um, so, uh, I grew up in this little town. I went in, as I think I told you, a a red brick school building, you know, went in one end at a kindergarten and came out, what, 13, 15 years later as a a senior, uh, uh, at the other end of the building. Mm -hmm. And it was one of these towns where one knew everyone, uh, and, um, everyone knew you. So, uh, uh, I still live in small towns. I prefer them, you know, and I kind of pick them out and live in them. I've been living in one for 25 years now. Are you able to trace your family back to, to like, Europe? And if so, like, what part of Europe? Yeah, on my dad's side and my mom's side. Yeah, so, I mean, I know all about my English family. Um, you know, that, it, and it's a surprise to me um, how hard life was for them when they fled here from an an approaching big civil war that really tore England apart and an economy that was on its back. Uh, You know, carpenters could not get paid, you know, um, to to understand um, in terms of your own family how hard uh, remaining you know, you don't just leave a network of loved ones and a way of life and a style, I don't have to tell you, behind without some serious reasons and pressure. So I really, in, in learning more about that story, I really understand the immigrant experience. My family had it too. Man. And, and I actually know quite a bit about it because there were records, right? So I know what the trouble they had, both in England and in New England. Right. And Lots the of factor. trouble in New England, too. That's right. So, so as a kid, of course, I didn't know any of this, and neither did any of our family, you know? Uh, my dad um, was a private detective. That was his job. 
uh, not working for the police, but he had his own investigation, his own company, which was um, uh, uh, the Associated Bureau of Investigation. It sounded very official, you know, <laughs> but it was my dad. <laughs> and um, I grew up uh, with him not telling us much about what he did. Um, uh, but us, my brother and I learning, we weren't the Hardy boys or something, you know, but we did, we did have a little romance and adventure in our lives, you know, uh, it was a very, uh, unusual occupation. You know, as somebody who grew up in kind of a small town, I guess a, a, a big city with a kind of a small town vibe, which is Spokane, Washington, I, I kind of, I look back at these small town experiences and I think there's something special. There's more out, there's more nature, um, and I don't want to generalize, but just compared to what I see in big in raising kids in the big city in the Bay Area, and just what I see around me, there's more nature, and with that comes a little more thinking about spirituality. Um, things are slower, right? Um, you you look for day, ways to fill your day. I, I just want to share that and see if what if you felt something no, it's similar. That's absolutely true. Um, and you know, I I met my first Muslim in that little town. He was uh, a Turkish. A French teacher, and he taught dueling as well. You know, mm. he taught swordsmanship, and he had uh, his French was perfect. His calligraphy was to die for. Beautiful board, blackboard calligraphy. Was that your first? Did you were yeah. you aware Zeki, that there's oh, yes, something called much, Islam, yeah. and there's some uh, even at that his young age? His name was Zeki Tamer, and um, he was a uh, he was a very unusual man <laughs> who um, who maintained his own way of life in this little town full of various kinds of Christians and a few Jews. He was the only Muslim in town. Mm. And I really liked him. And he really kind of liked me, too. I, I learned a lot about French poetry from him when I was in the 7th and 8th and ninth grades. Mm -hmm. And he just died a few years ago. Mm. He was a fruitarian. He ate fruit and a little bit of vegetables, but mostly fruit and nuts. Mm. Lived to be 101, and he was running great distances in his wow. 90s. He was, he was, people would say, a health fanatic. He was just Zeki Tamer, you know. He was a, a, a unique individual. Um, was, he a first, was he an immigrant or was he a, like a children? Well, a child? he was Turkish. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, he wore European suits from the day he arrived. I think I was in fifth grade, you know. He definitely cut a sartorial figure in our love it <laughs> that's right in our little town and he held his own he didn't take you know any trouble from anybody um uh, he was very concise and very smart and he was the first muslim i ever met and did, his wife did you just kind of was that something just kind of in the back of your head for many years or did you actually do um learn, dive into it a bit at that time as well i managed to graduate from a pretty good university knowing nothing about Islam, mm. or really Muslims. It was it, it, Zeki Tamer aside, but like many people in those days in America, and on perhaps in Turkey as well, religion was not, it was not a public issue, right? So everyone knew Zeki was from Turkey, but nobody made much of him being a Muslim. You know, I, and he didn't really make much of it either. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he was a practicing Muslim because when I went to his house, which I did a few times, you could tell. Now, in retrospect, I, I know what to look for. Um, but um, I didn't really, you know, Zeki was a very a big influence on me, but not spiritually or religiously. There was another man who also had that same effect on me, again, with poetry, because I grew up from the time I was about 15 being crazy about poetry. Hmm. That was it for me. Did that come from music by any I chance? I played or? some basketball, I played some football, but poetry <laughs> was my obsession, really, more than a passion. I want, I want to hear how that came about as yeah. well. Like, what? how does a 15-year-old right. yeah. Ohio, you know, yeah. Ohio boy get into yeah. poetry? Yeah. I was saying, well, like, is it from music, perhaps? or No. No, no it was from this other fellow. Um, so this guy was named Victor Reichert, and he was a rabbi. And he was also a very good friend of Robert Frost's. Oh, wow. Right? And my dad was Jewish, but he was a renegade from the whole 
orthodoxy of Judaism. He not only left his home and his family and that part of the state, when he came to southern Cincinnati, uh, southern Ohio, he really left his cultural religion behind. He was, like a lot of people in his generation, breaking out, becoming an American, free association. It was a whole style that a lot of people undertook at that, at, at that a, in that time. And my dad was one of them. And Cincinnati was historically the home of Reform Judaism, which took Hebrew out of the picture, took separating men and women out of the picture, became really quite um, progressive in a very not liberal town. Cincinnati's not a very liberal town. And this rabbi was a big influence on me because he loved poetry and because, you know, I didn't really regard myself as a Jew or a Christian, particularly. When I was in, from the time I was 12 or 13, it didn't really mean much to me one way or the other. Your parents weren't pushing one or the other? No, no, they were not. I went to Sunday school sometimes, <laughs> you know, um, I was never bar mitzvahed. I was in a confirmation class, which is a whole other thing. Like right. you read a few books, you know. So my, you know, my re whole religious life was very light, and it was split. My mom was running from her religion too. You know, I mean, as I think about it now, she didn't really want much to do with where she came from either. They were both striking out on their own. They did too. So um, this rabbi. It not only introduced me to Robert Frost, but introduced me to modern poetry. And he was a poet himself, and also a scholar of Job, Yacoub. So, a real scholar. I mean, he had done the big book, you know, for, for religious studies on Job. So, he was a big influence on me. And um, when I was 16, I, I, uh, I wrote a letter to a poet who was in a magazine. He was doing a column in a magazine. He was also, unbeknownst to me, the director of a writing writer's conference in Vermont called Breadloaf Writer's Conference. And we struck up a correspondence. I was crazy, you know. I was just like, I would do anything to get another step in poetry. And he finally said, well, you know, you ought to come up to Breadloaf. So I told my father, my father was a very permissive guy. You know, he said, okay. So at 16, I drove my little Fiat with the doors that open this way. You know, they open opposite to the way most car doors open. It was a tin can with an engine in it. And I drove it to Vermont and I met Robert Frost. Amazing. I, I picked blackberries with him. You know, I hung out with, he was there. He was eight miles away from this conference. He was kind of the, the presence you know, in the in the background. He gave long talks. He came down from the farm. You know, he's an old man. I was a kid. But it had a big impact on me. And this man, Victor Reichert, had a little cabin there, too. This was all unknown to me. So in a kind of convergence of my passions and my geography and, and this guy, Reichert, um, I, you know, had a very powerful experience in that that particular summer mm. of, um, of what it means to be a poet, to read poetry, to love poetry, to live by it in a certain way. And I would say until I became a Muslim, if I had a religion, that was my religion. <laughs> you know? Wow. So you, is that when you basically found your calling professionally at that point? Yes, it was. So when I went to college, um, I applied to one college. I didn't apply to six colleges. I applied to one college because there was a poet there that I wanted to work with. That's how crazy I was, <laughs> you know. Um, and that would be West, like Wesleyan. That was Wesleyan, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I worked with a poet named Richard Wilbur, who was a great translator as well. He gave me a love of translating, which I still have. I still translate, you know. So anyway, that got me to college. Um, where I learned languages. I studied other languages than English. I never took an English course. 
I didn't want anybody messing with me, <laughs> I guess, you know. I mean, I regret it now. I'm not very well read in my own literature. <laughs> but at the time, I wanted to learn German, I wanted to learn French, I wanted to learn Greek and Latin. So that's what I did uh, in college. I mean, it was completely worthless in terms of, a, you know, a job, mm -hmm. you know. But that's, again, how kind of, you could say passionate I was. You know? Yeah. So you're, you're pretty multi multilingual, huh? Uh, well, I do read those languages, yeah. you know, and I read them, I learned them well enough to read the poetry. So, you know, I mean, when I think about this now, when I even listen to myself tell my story, I think it's pretty odd. But at the time, it was the way I was, you know, it was how I was. You, um, you, you took the uh, road, the road less traveled. Very, very, very good. <laughs> now, is the, is the U.S. Plumber. wider call? Was that? That's yeah, Robert, I, got, I know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. So, yeah, I got yeah. it. <laughs> You're the engineer, so I just want to be a, I think. should be telling this with a sigh, ages and ages hence. I took the road less traveled by, yeah. and that has made all the difference. All the difference. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Omar had a good question. No, I was just wondering if the U.S culture the wider culture i guess this would be kind of when the counterculture right was coming up as well is was that playing a, a role into your into oh your goodness, i was gosh. just about to ask because i think this would place us in the 60s i mean when you start I graduated from high school in 63 i was in college for two months when kennedy was assassinated wow. mm -hmm. um that's right i was the in college would have for just two and a half years when martin luther mm -hmm. you know martin yeah. luther king was assassinated my mm -hmm. senior year right um so it was a very troubled time with a lot of violence and a lot of hard opinions on all sides and a lot of i guess you would say social revolution not political really but social revolution mm -hmm. right and um and i was and was not caught up in all of that you know i mean um when i left college i suppose anything could have happened but i got a grant for poetry. It was called the Amy Lowell Traveling Poet Scholarship. And the traveling was the key. You had to spend, it was not very much money, but you had to spend it out of the country. Amy Lowell was an American poet who thought that Americans should spend more time in Paris. That was the, you know, this is an old grant in the 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and every year they gave it to somebody. And one year they gave it to me. And I'd been to Europe once, and I went to Morocco, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You know, I arrived during Ramadan. I thought, oh, they're fasting. I'll fast too. As a 22-year-old? Yeah. Uh, well, I was 24. 24. Just out of college. Mm -hmm. I was curious, like, how, how, do, how, how would one avoid conscription back in the day? So there was a draft, right? Vietnam was waging. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I had a a uh, sort of a medical deferment. Okay. Yeah. So, so was that it? I mean, was that the only way? I mean, unless I guess. Um, no, not necessarily. Um, you could teach school. Okay. Uh, you could be married with children. Um, oh. Yeah. So there were a number of a okay. number of different ways. Um, Always fascinated me, obviously. As yeah, who, because you know that's a whole other world now. You that's know? right. And and um, of course Vietnam was a. A wedge issue, to say the least, you know. Certainly. N nobody I knew much wanted to go to Vietnam if they could help it. Um, of course, a lot of people I knew did go, and some didn't come back. Right. Um, so, sorry, you were, so you landed, you were in Morocco. Yeah, well, I went where, to Morocco. Yeah. Um, I lived through the winter there and survived. <laughs> oh, are they bad in, in Morocco in the winter? I lived in Morocco until, uh, I lived there for a year. Oh, an entire year, huh? So yeah. it wasn't just a few weeks or a few no, months? No, 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 no. I, I, I lived in Africa. After Morocco, I just kept going. Mm. So, and they kept, <laughs> after a year, I think it was because I kept going further into Africa, they got scared. So I applied for the grant a second time, which they never do. And they gave me the grant. And I applied, it, that, I applied from Senegal for the second year. And they gave me the grant. And it really wasn't very, it was quite a bit of money in Africa because the dollar was yeah. worth so much, right? But, um, and, and then the third year I applied from Ghana. So I was going down 
the kind of heart shaped part of Africa, yeah. you know, the part that bulges out. And and I mean, I remember in my, in, in your tw- in my twenties anyway, and I'm sure you all can relate. A year is a long time. It's very formative. Oh, if you do something for oh, a year goodness. in your twenties, I was it, gone for three and a half years. Yeah. I didn't see my parents. Puzzled them, let me tell you. Um, but I was so intrigued and so mesmerized, really, you know, by Africa, by the culture, mm-hmm. um, by the 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 wealth of these poor people the cultural wealth the societal wealth the family wealth that was really quite amazing and i just couldn't stop you know i just went on as long as i could sometimes i think i'm i'm not sure why i came home you know <laughs> i just you know uh, but i got as far as ghana yeah and i lived each place i stopped for at least a few months and sometimes longer so it was a very unusual experience. Again, you know, when I look at it now, I think, whoa, you know, but that poetry, you know, best gig I ever had. I had to send him 10 poems at the end of the year. Mm. Whoa, you know what I mean? So you're writing, but yeah. I presume you're also immersing in the culture and potentially even getting more exposure to Islam. Is that right? Yes. Well, you said you well, fasted. Well, I met when... a lot of Muslims. Right. Right? I mean, Morocco's 90-whatever percent Muslim. That's right. Pretty hard to miss Muslims in Morocco. And West Africa, Ghana, where I lived quite a, quite a while, almost a year and a half, was uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. And the part I lived in was very Muslim. So I had these experiences of Muslims and of Islam that, on the one hand, didn't make me want to be a Muslim, but I felt very comfortable with these people, you know, and I liked the way they carried themselves. Uh, you know, I mean, you're driving across a border from one country to the next, and everybody gets out of the car uh, at Zor Prayer, and they pray. And it's the desert, and all the cars stop, and nobody really knows each other, but they all line up, and they, you know, it was very powerful. Um, you know, riding in a taxi cab and watching a cab driver pull over to the side of the road and say, Monsieur. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, to getting his rug out of the carpet out of the back of the taxi and, you know, praying for five minutes and getting back in and we go our way. Um, the portability of the religion, the, um, the quality of the people that I met and the way the religion kind of came out of the woodwork. They weren't wearing it on their sleeves. That's correct. You know, mm. this wasn't a time of political Islam. It was 1969. Exactly. It was 1970. Right. You know, it was before that. And um, yeah. honestly, even in the 80s, when I became a Muslim, I thought I was joining a kind of nice, quiet, little backwater segment of <laughs> ethical monotheism. Right. You know? I mean, here's all these characters from the Bible that I knew very well in the Quran. It all seemed like we were all cousins here to me, you know. It took me a while to wise up to the fact that there were also some fairly serious uh, cultural divisions here and political, of course, too. Right. Because certainly by the 80s, you know, like you mentioned, political Islam, you know, that had really sort of taken over almost, if you would. But but before, I mean, sorry, because there's so many things that you raised that are fascinating. I, I, I wanted to take you back a little bit, you know, and just ask you to comment on this, perhaps. Uh, we've had so many guests, and a common trait, if you will, is um, white, middle class, uh, you know, one could argue religious sensibilities, you know, whether it's Protestant or, in your case, like Jewish and Christian, but certainly white, uh, middle class, uh, this, ne- this sort of a a desire, especially in the 60s, to kind of find themselves, and they go overseas. Um, and so, would you say that that was something that you saw even in Morocco when you went there? Because, like I said, you would. There, there's so many overlapping people that I can just top name on the, off the top of my head mm-hmm, who mm-hmm. would be in Morocco in the 60s. People, in fact, we've had on the show Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, mm-hmm, um, you know, mm-hmm. Peter Sanders, so many people. But again, sort of, you know, um, I'm just curious about Hakeem Marshaletta. But anyway, so many people come to mind. You probably now know them, but 
you know, certainly now as we're documenting this for the, on the podcast, I'm finding this kind of common thread. I did I'd love not, your commentary. Yeah, yeah, I did you, not have an interest in religion myself. Right. And even in college, when many of my friends were kind of adopting a new religion every month or something, you know, <laughs> I mean, it seemed to me like that. Um, I wasn't game. Got it. You know? Even if it wasn't religion, but something to, like, the, the, the appeal of the, you know, I don't want to say exotic, because right. I don't want to orientalize this, but, you know, the appeal yeah. of, of something beyond America. Are you saying, Pervez, like, did, did, uh, did Michael come across any other people that he Not met? Not just come across, like, w- w- just having him sort of analyze, if you will, like, what was it going on in America? Was it, you know, obviously the war, there was a lot of upheaval social that sort of propelled these individuals to go, to go search for themselves and find meaning beyond America. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, there many, many people where it was like casting seeds out into the wind, you know, and I thought it was really a wonderful thing. I mean, m- my idea of foreign policy to inf- approve, make an American foreign policy, let alone improve it, um, would be to just give passports to every graduate from high school and college. Just give them a passport, you know, get them out of the country. Yeah. Let them understand that there's a world out there, you know, that it doesn't end at Kansas or whatever border they're in, but that there's a world out there and that we have an effect in it. And I certainly, um, yeah. And, and also of course, you know, the sixties, I mean, gosh, you know, you know, it was such a, a time, (laughs) you know, for these, for big changes, you know, everyone was, you know, I think it was poetry that saved me from that in a certain way. You know, it's, poetry is a rather conservative operation, you know. That's a, kind a of really interesting Basic point. emotions, right. basic ideas. People say, you know, poetry is either about love or death or society and friendship. You know, it's sort of like three themes. If you start looking at poetry, they're all about one of those things. Mm-hmm. So true. And, uh, so it's very, I don't want to say conservative, but conserving. Grounding, grounding yeah. maybe. And it was very grounding for me, you know. Yeah. Uh, language in general was very grounding. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. I have many friends who um, who uh, went to India or went to Indonesia, either on a music program or a religious program or both. Correct. Um, in my class and so on. And I, some of them I still correspond with even, you know. Right. Who become terrific musicians and and so on, and of course in the religious side, I became a Muslim because I had a crisis in my life, and and Islam really solved it for me, you know. Hmm. I would not otherwise have done it, and I was forty. I had been in all these Muslim countries for years, and it never occurred to me to become a Muslim. I want to make sure we don't skip over anything because then you, you got. The, I think you mentioned you converted in eighty. Um, but we're still in the no, late 60s. It was more like 85, 86, oh, wow. 87, <laughs> after 15 years of thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think your bio said you were age 40. Yeah, well, yeah, he, just, he just said that yeah, too, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. I, like I said, I, I don't want to gloss over anything. So I'll, I'll defer to you if you want to talk about that now or would you, or are there certain other um, sort of milestones that happen in the, sure. in the 60s and 70s. And, and one just question I had an interest in, you, you had mentioned that like in Morocco <clears> – <throat> things weren't politicized. I don't know if the, you know, our listeners who were not to pick on them, but like the, our millennial and younger listeners even know what that means. Like, what what do you mean it wasn't political? What was it like if it wasn't political? Like, I would love to just hear a little more about that. Like, what was it like if you're saying there wasn't that I, politicization or, or of, of Islam? Well, just from an observation point of view. I think, I mean, that's actually a good point because I understood political Islam to mean a very specific thing. And Omar, you're asking, yeah, like, just be like when you say didn't speak to you. Yeah, so, what were the people if, if they weren't engaged in kind of wearing Islam on their sleeves politically? Like, what did you see? Or did you just see people being spiritual, being good neighbors? I'm just curious what that experience. Just to, to find talk a little more about that experience, about what your experience, about what it was like seeing these people and kind of how they were living. I'd love just to I, hear a little more about yeah. that. I don't want to answer the question, but maybe another thing that you mentioned earlier that I, um, like a little seed that I would like to pick up on as well, would be this idea that you mentioned of of wealth, 
like there being this sort mm -hmm. of civilizational and cultural wealth, I think maybe that'll dovetail into what Omar is asking too. Because yeah, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I mean, what what I saw in Morocco was was a country full of individuals. I saw very little repetition of personality type. I saw people who were really very distinct and who were uh, bound together by a practice of Islam which was, um, in a certain way, the saving grace of the country. Here was this, you could call it a, a uh, kingdom, but, you know, really it was a military dictatorship in many ways. People were very under the gun and economically deprived because of the way the country was set up. Um, and yet, there was a, an amazing sense of humor operating. There was a lot of camaraderie um, amongst the people that I knew, young and old, and some of them were very old people that I knew. Um, they had uh, the unifying aspect of Islam to kind of protect them in a way from this very predatory uh, government, you know, that you better be very careful of or you might not, you know, be at home in the morning. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, Islam was, I believe, the, uh, the core of this wealth. But these were people who, when I say wealth, I certainly don't mean dirhams. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about um, the way that people carried themselves and even and, and that there seemed to be an interplay between the poor and the middle class, a lot of charity, on the spot charity, you know the 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 hand with the coin, you know on top giving the coin, lots of that going on in the marketplace, unspoken, unsaid, just that's the way we are, that's what we do, and the neighborhoods, are still, you can't tell from walking past a set of doors, whether a poor person, a poor family, or a rich family, they live on top of each other. Or you have to go through the door and into the house to see what's going on. So the ghettoization that we're so familiar with um, was less apparent. It wasn't that there weren't bidonville and you know right. so on, I mean, but um, that's kind of a French word for, for the tin houses and ghetto. Of course there was poverty. A lot. But there was also this kind of cheek by jowl of the wealthy and the poor and the middle class. People just lived together. Mind you, this is now, you know, a while ago. I don't think I'm romanticizing. I mean, I lived in these places for a while and I saw a lot of trouble, but I also saw, um, uh, you know, a, a different way of, of being a community. And, um, and I liked it. It's what kept me going, really. You know, it wasn't so much the music or the religion or the pretty clothes or, or even, you know, the beauty of the landscape, although it is a very beautiful country. I, yeah, I, I certainly don't think you're romanticizing. I'm just, it saddens me to think that it may, although it may be sort of an artifact now. I don't know if you've been back to some of these countries. And if, if you have... Yeah. what the I changes think the, are. I think the, the, the Maghreb, well, and particularly Morocco because of that mountain chain, because the French were only there for 50 years, as opposed to next door where they were there for 300 years in Algeria. It's, it's um, it, there's, uh, I, I could walk into the market in Marrakesh and find someone who could bind a book that looked like the books on your shelf here, the old leather bindings, right? I remember taking uh, a, a, a uh, when I was on my way to Mecca, I stopped in Morocco for quite some time, and I had a Quran, a paperback Quran, and I took it to one of these guys and asked him to bind it. And for $7, he turned this into like a medieval wonder, you know? And he still knew how to do it. I love that. Y you can't find that you in the don't. Middle East. Yeah. Anywhere. That's right. I don't think, you know, not that I've ever been. There are these traditions. I, I know when I was in Mecca um, or in Medina the first time, 
I was not surprised to learn that the new domes in, in the mosque had been designed in Morocco. And the first one, the prototype, big domes designed in Morocco and then brought over with Moroccan craftsmen who then made these domes because there wasn't anybody in Saudi Arabia who knew how to do that. So, so there, there's like a cultural wealth and skill, right? Correct. That still was around and that just amazed me and pleased me and made me feel at home. You know, uh, the word po poet, poetry, the word for poetry in Greek is just to make. That's all it is. So to watch people make things and really do it from this ancient tradition uh, was delightful to me, you know. And I think, it, I mean, my sense is that that's still in Morocco. It's still there. I mean, I've been back. You know? it, it, it's changed a lot less than, you know, than Ohio. <laughs> Has... Um what was that already disappearing in America when you left the sort of like, I, you, like you touched on something so beautiful, uh, you know, the artisanship of just binding a book, getting clothes tailored, um, you know, like craftsmanship. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Cause the sixties, I, I, at least the way I romantic, uh, I, I mean, I, I was born in the seventies, but yet I always say I was born probably 10 years too late because to me, the sixties represent the last vestige of that of that america is that true i don't think so no no okay. i mean you know we're we're at the mercy of our media you know <laughs> so it had already you know, disappeared? i think there's is a lot of mean? small a lot of small towns and little places oh even where now. you know where where somebody is keeping this and that alive and blending and you know different kind of roof a little different than the one it was made 400 years ago but they've got the you know they're playing with it they're playing with it I, I see that all over the Northwest, really. You know, when you get up into Oregon and Washington, there are there are a lot of people who are cutting against the grain of, of I don't know to what end in the end. You know, I mean, you well, know, we do live in a manufactured society. We live in a technological world. Yeah. We live in an electronic world. We, all of that is very true, but um, you know, but there are also uh, people who are kind of you know growing their own vegetables in the backyard and. Living, living, living a quiet life. Omer well, and I have this ongoing <laughs> conversation about utilitarianism, <laughs> <laughs> and so what Michael's talking about really resonates with me yeah. because um, I don't. I think we've lost so much in yeah. pursuit and of I, utilitarianism. And I appreciate that. I mean, basically, the the backstory is that I tend to be very practical, uh -huh. and he's very. Um, so I'm the I'm the utilitarian. He's more the yeah. aesthetic. He yeah. likes the aesthetic and the leisure yeah. values. But I I can absolutely appreciate. I just yeah. try to balance you know yeah balance those two things. Um, yeah. But no, I'd love to. So, kind of bridge us, take us from coming back to Morocco all the way to what you referred to as that, that did you refer to as, to as, a, as a crisis or a challenge that you, felt, that you had in the mid-80s? So, maybe bridge, help us bridge the gap between sure. coming back and sure. then all the way yeah. leading up to that. Yeah. Well, um, there was a moment, uh, you know, I had it in mind having seen what I saw in Africa where I thought maybe I could do this in South America. If I was, you know, I could see another continent and I had everything in a backpack and I came back to the U.S. and I taught school for a summer and made some money. I never had much money, really, you know. So this was all, again, a little crazy, you know. I mean, not exactly nailed down, uh, but, but my interest was to travel some more. And I got as far as Mexico City uh, one night and, um, and I... I I had been in the U.S. for three months, and I really liked hearing my language again. You know, I really liked hearing American. Not necessarily English, right but up. hearing American. And, um, I love it. And I, I didn't pay attention to that uh, so much. I just had it on out. You know, I was moving forward. So I had my backpack, and I, was, I made it as far as Mexico City. And, um, and I decided to turn around and come home. I didn't go back to Ohio, uh, I, but I came back to California. And I moved into a little town, uh, Bolinas, up in Marin County, out on the edge of the water. And my next door, I needed a gig, you know. I mean, it was okay for a few months. 
but I needed a job. And this was a town of 1,500 people. So what? You know, I was going to find a job. And my next door neighbor owned a bookstore. And um, she was then in her 60s. And uh, Mary Whitmer. And she wanted to sell the bookstore. And she sold it to me for $5,000, which was about what I had. Um, and this was a little building about half the size of this room we're in right now. Oh, well, you know, kind of that much of a bookstore. And I ran it for five years, you know. Um, I went over to Berkeley every month, and uh, this is the best part of the job. Um, you had uh, something like a shopping cart, but bigger, and uh, in a warehouse full of books, not food. And they were, on, they were stacked up on bookshelves, and I could go through and pick the books that I thought might sell. And I would spend all day doing that, shopping for the books that were going to be my livelihood for the next month or two if I was lucky. And uh, I, I really like that part of the job a lot. <laughs> you know, per, per, I have to say, so Parvez kind of gives me a hard time for being that utilitarian, but there's something about bookstores. I, I being, you know, coming from, uh, being, you know, coming, growing up in the 80s and even the 90s, pre-Amazon, I, I could go spend hours and hours in a bookstore, and it's 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 our kids don't have that. Um, they yeah. they sh they yeah. they ask for a book, and we click and get it on Amazon for sure. them. But there's no there's sure. none of that sitting and exploring. Uh, you sure. know all the possibilities out there. Sure. Well, I do too. I mean, I I have probably 500 books on my Kindle, and I'm very happy I can do that. You know, if I have to travel, I can take some clothes with me. You know, <laughs> it's great, <laughs> and still have 500 books. So I don't, you know, I don't uh, thumb my nose at the electronics of, of books. But at that time, that's the way I settled into this little town. I was the guy that owned the bookstore. And it was perfect for me because I met everybody in town one at a time. And that's kind of how I am. You know, I don't do very well at parties, really. You know, I'm not comfortable. So comfortable. Um but I like many people one-to-one, -one, you know, and so that was five years of that. It was great. And, you know, I still, I, I stuck by books. As a, as a, it wasn't a great living, but it was a living, you know, it worked out for me. Um, I went from that to a book bindery. I learned to make books. And that was another business that I was in for years, you know. Um I started a publishing company and published books. So, you know, books, books, books. You, um, you, Barbez and I just eyed, eyed each other. Because you're my hero so far. <laughs> like right now, the, the, like the story so far for our listeners, uh, Michael Wolf is my new hero. Oh, well, we the, the binding well, story, I, right? I, I, I wish I could show it because it's a visual thing. Yeah. But I have an entire bookshelf of, uh, um, I, I grew up reading comic books. And I wanted to preserve them for, mm. I mean, posterity, but more importantly, because my girls aren't that much into comic books, it's really more just for the aesthetics of it. So I got my comics bound. Nice. Uh, I'm going to make sure I show them to you before you leave. But um, Absolutely. one of my prized possessions, I'd say that in my vinyl records. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Speaking shout, of shout out, shout out to, to Zucky for uh, introducing you to the, the binding. Right? Yeah. Well, I, kind of. No, okay. I, that's just giving Zucky too much credit. <laughs> um, I, my, uh, when I used to go visit India, um, my aunt, mm. my aunt, uh, my, my mater, so my maternal uncle's aunt, yeah. Reshmanti, yeah. um, she, she had books, uh, she had her comic books bound from her oh, childhood. Really? So I, I, I read, I, I used to go there and, I, and during the summers I would read Mandrake the Magician, the magician mm. and Phantom comics okay. and Tarzan and they were all bound. Okay. Oh, so that was my first, yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So. So that's my amazing. My partner in, in the movie making world, Alex, would love talking to you. He loves comic books. He has a big collection. Yeah, we, we both uh, we both are big yeah. big comic book collectors. That's right. And graphic novels too. Do you like graphic novels? Yeah, actually, I, I don't read. To be honest, I don't read too many comics yeah. anymore. And you, you yeah. still dabble, but definitely growing up for sure. Um, but well, uh, you yeah. asked me about my crisis. Correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it was in this small town. It's but the same not small town you've people. been in, same place, the bookstore. Yeah. Um, Believe. Same town. I, I was there for 15 years. But about the last five years, I would say, I had an, uh, 
a repetitive experience that really, in the end, became a nightmare for me. And it was very quiet. It didn't have to do with um, any of the sort of definable psychological problems that I know about. But I began to feel like I was missing life, you know? I mean, I was living. <laughs> I had friends. I was moving about. Um, but there was something, and, and the only analogy I can give is kind of like, you've got a bowl of soup in front of you, and you lift the soup to your lips, and you drink the soup, but you don't taste it. That was kind of where I was. And, and uh, no family, like no, not not married or anything at not this yet. time? Okay. Not yet. And that could well have been, you know, part of the problem, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but um, I was heading into my so late 30s, and I I noticed this. For one thing, I was I was moving quickly. I, I had a car. I was living in the in the country. But if I wanted to go to the city, it was a forty five minute drive. There were these it, there were these invitations to move quickly and make transition fast transitions from city to country. Um, so I felt a real need to slow my life down. But before I did, I had an auto accident. I was in a truck with a friend of mine, and we were, the Bolinas Lagoon is kind of before you get to Bolinas. We were on the windy road on the Bolinas Lagoon, and a Porsche, German sports car, came around the corner at about 80 miles an hour. And fortunately, we were in a big truck. But that, for about three months, put me out of commission. And when I got back to the place where I could walk, right, where I felt comfortable walking, I went over to Berkeley to a bookstore and I bought some exercise books. And I, down in the left-hand corner of the lower shelf, there was a little book, a $3 Muslim prayer book, How to Pray in Islam. And it was published in Lahore. And it had pictures of a 15-year-old kid doing Salat. And I thought, well, that's an exercise that I know something about. I've watched people do that a lot. And I brought it home, and I had a, a music stand. And I rubber-banded this book open onto the music stand so I could stand in front of it and memorize the prayers and the postures. And fortunately, this had translation and a transliteration as well as the Arabic. So I could hear how, because I never learned Arabic. So I could hear what the Arabic sounded like. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. I could see it. And I memorized it. I was a memorizer from poetry, right? So it wasn't hard for me to memorize. It took me about a month because it wasn't my language. But I memorized the sounds. And I taught myself to do the salat, and I felt better. I also had a yoga book and, you know, different exercise books. But this one, I kind of got into it, you know. And before very long, I knew how to pray. And um, I was already on the mend. I don't want to say that it cured me, but it certainly made me feel good. And, it, and the idea that you would do this five times a day, that you would just stop, not because you decided it was time to stop, but because it was time to stop on the clock. You just stop. And that answered my need to do something that wasn't my decision, but just needed to be done. So I took it seriously, because I, I could see that, that, that I needed that. you know. And one thing kind of led to another in that regard. I just kept adding little parts of Islam. Not very much, really, not very much. But, uh, but the, the Salat, I took very seriously. And after about six or eight months of that, I got in a car one day and I drove over to San Jose. The nearest mosque was the Third Street Mosque that I knew about. I mean, there may have been somewhere else, something. But it was... Uh, 
Muhammad Sadiq, Imam Siddiqui. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, an Imam who was like four foot nine or something you know he was a really beautiful little guy if 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 you're saying who we think you are we're friends with his son who's now you know grown grown, grown man our his, age yeah yeah, yeah. Well, maybe even a little older for sure oh that's right but, yeah, uh, Muhammad, Muhammad Siddiqui. wow yeah, so he I've, was he, I've heard that he might was be the, if I'm not mistaken he was the I'm imam saying. at the third street mosque and it was a house it wasn't a mosque mm -hmm. um and you know two three hundred people would show up there on Fridays I went on Thursday I wasn't really very sure of myself at all about anything. I didn't really know what I was doing. But I went to the mosque, and I introduced myself. And he took me into the library. We walked in the door on the left-hand side, there was a library. Well, that felt pretty good to me. You know? It's still there. <laughs> I mean, well. <laughs> so we sat down at a big, long table, and he said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I'm not sure. But I wondered if it would be okay if... Some Fridays, I didn't want to commit to anything, you know. I said, some Fridays I came and sat over in the corner during the prayer. I'd just like to see how it goes. And I told him what I've been doing. And he said the thing that made everything else possible. He said, sure. You know. And if he had said anything else, I would have walked out and never come back. You know. But Amazing. he said, sure. So, on Fridays, this white guy... And that was not a common sight in these days. This was like 1980, I don't know what, 88, mm -hmm. probably. Um, 88, 89. Anyway, um, I was there in the corner and uh, for about two months or three months. And I did show up every Friday. And then, and then Hodge time came around. It was getting to be Hajj time. You know, we were within about two months of it. And so the chutbah the, you know, started to be about the Hajj. And that really lit me up because I had previously, I'd written, I, I loved writing travel stuff. I'd written travel articles. I wanted to write a travel book. And a Moroccan author named Mohammed Marabit, who had published like eight or nine books, he was a good writer. Well, he's a good storyteller. Um, he and I became friends and uh, in Tangier, in Morocco, because I returned there from time to time for a week or two when I could get the money together. Um, and he said to me one day, I have, he was a very dramatic guy, you know, he said, I've done everything else in life, wife, children, job, now I must make the Hajj. And I, and I said, uh, oh, that sounds really great. He said, why don't you come with me? And I knew enough about Islam to know that I couldn't go with him. I said, you know, Muhammad, I'm not a Muslim. He said, well, come as far as Jeddah. <laughs> you know, so we cooked up this plan where we were going to ride his motorcycle across North Africa, and I was going to write a book about whatever happened. And I actually more or less sold that idea to a publishing company. So I had, it turned out he'd never made the Hodge. You know, about three years later, he said he, he, he nixed the whole thing. But uh, I was ready. So, you know, when I made the Hodge, you know, it was kind of like, I didn't go with Muhammad and he being the Muslim, I went with me being the Muslim. You know, it was like a, a kind of a joke on me in a certain way, you know. But I was really engaged when the, when the, the sermon, the chutbah, started being about Hajj. And, and so when you're attending the Friday prayer, nobody's pressuring you about... Nobody. Okay. No, it was all, sure. It wasn't even that. You know, it was just kind of, how are you? What you doing? You know? Well, we got to about, I don't know, maybe four of those chutbahs together. And one day during the Friday prayer, the Juma prayer, I just stood up and joined the prayer line. It seemed ridiculous not to. You know, I was ready. It wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. I just, and, um, and then I was a Muslim. I mean, you know, it was a kind of gulp time for me, you know, because I had done this with, a, you know, it seemed the most natural thing in the world, but now I'm a Muslim. So what, what's next? And I thought, well, I'm going to Mecca. Because I'm never really going to learn this religion unless I do. I've got to, like, 
I needed an immersive experience, you know, to really get this. And I didn't feel I could get it in San Jose. I don't know why I thought that. I probably was wrong. But I felt that would be what I needed to do. So I made moves in that direction. And then I talked to this publisher again. And I said, well, what if I write a book about me going to Hodge? And they said, yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. So I took these little notebooks. They're, you know, just little three by four no notebooks stitched on one side, very small. And I, when I went, I spent some time in Morocco, and then I finally went to Mecca in the summertime. Um, and I, I just noted what happened each day on a page or two. It wasn't a lot of writing, but it was a way for me to not forget what had happened. Because, you know, we, you don't know when you set out to write something as an idea, whether it's a story, an article, a, a novella. Uh, you don't know how long it is. Length does not immediately suggest itself, at least for me. So I wanted to see if there was a real book here or not. When I got home, I had these books. And I looked at them pretty closely, and I typed them up as notes, and I could see that there was a book here. It was a travel book. And it, was, and it was this opportunity to put together the travel book, which is a pretty secular operation, you know. It's like an investigative report with a spiritual experience. And that really interested me, you know, that, that there would maybe be some way to put those two things together. Um, and then I had this, I was right about that going to Mecca made me a Muslim. It really did. I was praying five times a day with a million people, you know, all in one mosque. And any question I had, I was, I just had to look around, you know. It wasn't hard to learn the religion, you know, it was easy. Um, I didn't have to go to school, you know, I just was there. Then when I came home, I had this remarkable opportunity of being able to live with that experience for three years while I wrote the book, because I'm a pretty slow writer. So every day, you know, I realized like a lot of people go on Hajj and they never have that gift. It was a gift. I was, my job was to think about the Hajj for three years, you know, you could say. Um, so it was not only an immersive experience in Mecca, but it became an immersive experience here, right? And that's really how I became a Muslim, you know, in that process. And it's kind of always been that way with me. You know, writing has always been the way I, uh, I don't know, I don't know what words to use here after this, but you know what I'm saying, you know, it's process. a way to get my arms yeah, around, we say, something. you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, way you, the way you process it. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I'm, I'm curious if, uh, if, if that's the book that would eventually become the Hajj. Yes. Book. Yes. Okay, that's yes. probably, I mean, I haven't read all of your books, but that's really a personal favorite of mine. Yeah, so, yeah me too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just read some of it. I don't read my own books very often, you know, I mean, I'm trying to move on here. But, um, but I, um, I did read uh, a chapter or two when I knew we were going to get together just to, you know, and I... Yeah, it's pretty good, you know. <laughs> right, because <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> no, no, and, and and then your I I, I don't know what it, I don't think it's your follow up book, but then the Thousand Roads to Mecca, um, that reminds me more of like a travel log of because you chronicle other Muslim travelers, yeah, who went to, or pilgrims, I should say. When when the Hajj book came out, yeah. it was nineteen ninety three, I think, or four. Mm -hmm. It took me three years to write. When it came out, um. It did very well, and, it, and a lot of people read it. And I wrote it so that nobody could say after they read it, I don't know anything about Islam, you know? I mean, I really wrote it for non-Muslims. I, being a Muslim, I mean, I knew, you know, I wrote it for Muslims too. But, but I wanted people who, who kept trying to say that Islam's a big mystery, you know, um, that it, I, I didn't want them to be able to say that after they read the book. I wanted them to understand what was going on here. And, um, and that was really my sort of the engine that kept me going in a way. I don't know if I accomplished that or not, but that was my 
driving idea. And, uh, you know, just to make it, um, yeah. So when I finished that book, the publisher said, well, do you have anything else? And I said, well, I read a lot of accounts of the Hajj. You know, there are many more than you think. And some of them are really good books. And they're all telling in a certain way. And they span a thousand years. They're not sort of one, you know, each one is its own story. But, and I think what intrigued me most was that um, you know, you over a thousand years are going through so many changes historically and transportation and culture and wars and the planet is the whole planet is changing and certainly the human aspects of it are changing. The rights remain the same. The rights remain the same. So there's this, I mean, there are wars going on in, uh, on the ground and uh, during the Hajj. Everything and anything happens if you look at that thousand year period. Unbelievable stuff, but the rights remain the same. And there, that was very appealing to me, you know, that, and that contradiction, I guess you would say, or that, that truth. Because, yeah. and, and it's so fascinating what you're saying, because those rights are even pre Islamic. They're yeah. almost primordial, yeah. right? Because yeah. they come from Abraham. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and they survive. You know, or they they remained intact, although adulterated. You know, leading up to the time of the Prophet Muhammad, which by most accounts is probably two thousand years. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not two thousand years. But uh, anyway, I, I, between Abraham and Muhammad, I'm saying. So this is fascinating. What, what you're bringing up about the rights yeah. remaining the same, and and, and the, the the genius of the Prophet peace be upon him in putting the rights together the way he did. Because we kind of know how they were before. We kind of know what they represented, and we kind of know where they came from, too. Um, and the way in which he, 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 you know, it's kind of like a sculpture that you make out of a lot of loose parts, right? You know, very modern concept, right? Where kind of 20, 20 21st century sculptures that you see sometimes, right? Um, uh that's a bit of what the Hajj is in a certain way. It's a construct of a very ancient. Um, that fascinated me all, you know, how that all serves a modern uh, contemporary uh, psyche. You know, it's really a work of genius, the Hajj. You know, it really is. I mean, it's just... And in, in, and in his time, you know, it, it, it very masterfully indigenized um, you know, Islam to Arabia because yeah. the Arabs understood yeah. the fact that okay, yeah. this is something that is part of you know. If anybody ever needed Islam, those guys needed it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but you know, <clears throat> because I mean, the Arabia specifically, or I should say, Arabia in general, and certainly Mecca specifically, was not known for anything other than this this pilgrimage. So. You know, the the genius of the prophet was also to sort of root and indigenize Islam to 7th century Arabia. Yeah. But at the same time, like you said... Reclaim it. To reclaim that, mm -hmm. that tradition, right? That's what you're saying. You're right? reclaiming it, but you're also rooting it in 7th century Arabian, you know... Yeah. Uh, 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 um, what's the word I'm looking for? But, you know, like yeah. culture. Practice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Milieu, milieu. Yeah. That's the, yeah so. so let's talk about the nightline Special for sure. I know. So that was around ninety seven, I believe, nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, yeah. How did that come about? Well, I had been on Hodge a couple of times by then, uh, and one day in that year, about six weeks before we went, um, a guy called me up um, from ABC. He was a producer uh, who I later got to know. I traveled with him. We went to Mecca together, although he was Canadian Catholic. Mm. So we had, we had two units. One was the four Muslims who went up to Mecca every day and late at night brought the rushes back down. And then there were the, the Christians and the whoever's, you know, who were about, who were editing. Mm. We took over a floor in a Holiday Inn, 19 cases of equipment. It was a very... You know, very hard to get through customs. The Saudi government was fully supportive? Well. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, it's not one person, the Saudi government. You have to go yeah. through, like, you know, there were times when, I'll tell yeah. you that story in a minute. We were arrested a few times. Mm. Um, but, but how it came about was a phone call. And um, uh, the, the question was, do you know anybody who could go with us uh, and, uh, and who knows enough about the Hajj to write a script for us and narrate it? And I, I, I have told the story many times, but it's true. Um, there was kind of a 10 second pause on my end while I tried to think of somebody. And then I said, well, nobody but me. And of course, that was why he called. He had read this book. And he thought I would be a good person to at least try to interest in this. And so we talked about it for a while. And I wasn't entirely sold on the idea. I said, I, I said I'm, I, it sounds good enough to me to come to Washington and talk to you about it. And I'd like to talk to Koppel too. That's what I said. And, and then I said, and when is this? And uh, it's a year from now, right? I said. <laughs> Because um, I was working on the Thousand Rods to Mecca book, and that's a lot of scholarship. That book takes, you know, took a lot of. So he said, no, no, it's in six weeks. And I said, well, that's another reason I want to come to Washington. I need to talk to you guys. And the reason I said that was, and he said, sure. And a week later, I was in Washington, and we were talking at this office. And um, two things happened during that time. Um, one was we were sitting around a table and I asked the question that I'd been asking all, you know, myself all along, which is, so if we're in the middle of a program about the Hodge and something happens, are you going to cut to the news or is this really about the Hodge? You know, what if there's, uh, I don't know, I didn't say this, but you know, what if, what if there's some trouble, Right. And uh, at that time, there had been some trouble here and there. Uh, and I remember this uh, a f a producer, the guy whose idea this was, um, pounding the desk. He said, this uh, film is going to be about religion. It's going to be about the Hajj. It's going to be about Muslims in a sacred moment, not about anything else. And I looked around the table. There were like seven or eight of us there, a few producers and Koppel and a few other, and this guy who was sitting next to me. And uh, they all agreed. So I said, okay, I'm in. Because I didn't want to be used, you know. I didn't want to, I really, by this time, I was aware of how the media could mess with you. And I was also very aware of the importance of the Hajj. And um, it wasn't that important to me, you know, for ABC Nightline to do a 22-minute program on the Hodge if they were going to fool around in any way at all, you know. But they didn't, you know, and um, they kind of convinced me that they weren't going to. Um, the other thing that happened was the, the guy who, um, who really was the idea man for Koppel, who kind of brought the stories to Ted Koppel. He took me in a little side room. He said, do you have any questions? And I said, yeah, I do. I have one question. How do you, what's the voice of this story? You've got two and a half million people there. What do you, how do you, how do you capture that? He's, and he, he did a really odd thing. He, um, he took a tape and put it in a tape recorder or put it in a player, a little boom box, pushed it in, turned up the volume and left the room. <clears throat> and it was a reporter from the Second World War talking about going through um, Germany after the war and the terrible things that he had seen there. And he was always talking as a person, as one person. And he came back in the room and he said, he said, uh, do you get it? And I said, well, it's one person just talking about an experience that millions of people have been through. Is that what you're trying to tell me? He said, yeah. You know, this is this, you're, you're the person who's going to lead millions of Americans on the Hodge, although they've never been there or never are going. That's who you are. So write like that. And it was crystal clear to me that, at that point, you know, I got a writing loss, you know.
So those were the two things. I was really glad I went to Washington, not just to kind of get the assurance that they weren't going to mess with this, but also he taught me something, you know, about big events and how to represent them personally, is what he was saying. Was it always pitched as being a documentary style where you would be, it would be scripted and, you know, you would be narrating mm -hmm. and then it would be followed up with like a live interview? Well, you know, it's, you know, I haven't watched this program in a long time, but I think it starts with me in the desert saying Correct. something about my own background. And, right? So that was the, we, I, I insisted on nailing the personal thing first, you know. This is about, I, it wasn't that it was about me, God knows, you know. But, but viewers have to have somebody, if, if you're going to take somebody by the hand, and walk them through an experience they've never had before. They have to know you or think they know you. And the only way you can do that is introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. So so we always knew that would happen. It's interesting you asked that question about the interview because that was not on the cards in the beginning. But um, And Koppel didn't want to do it. But the director, the Ali, he was a Palestinian guy, insisted he said, you, th this has got to go back to Washington. It's got to, you've got to reconnect with your audience. And he was right. You know, he That's was beautiful. Right. Yeah. And you alluded to some challenges in the production? Huh? You, you alluded to some challenges in the production? Like, oh, uh, well, yeah. The authorities? Okay. I'm glad you caught me there, yeah. So um, our, our cameraman, Bisher, he was an Egyptian. He was a geologist by trade who had become a camera, he's a great guy to be in the desert with. He could pick up a handful of sand and really talk about it. Um, Bisher, who, who performed the Hodge. You know, when you're making a movie, you do, you do this one day, you do that the other day, you put it all together later. But somehow, by wiliness and insistence, and he wasn't going to miss his chance, he made the Hodge while he was photographing all this. One day he disappeared. It was at the um, before the rush. You know, you're, you you've finished the the high point uh, of Arafat, and you're ready to go to Mustafa, and you're waiting for the sun to go down. And the director wanted a picture of everybody rushing toward the camera. You don't film people from the back. Bisher needs to be in front of these people across the line. You're not allowed to cross the line by Hodge rules, until the sun goes down. Bisher disappeared with the camera. They were really upset. But he was honoring his Hodge, you know? So he was an amazing guy. I bring up Bisher because he's the reason we got arrested a lot of times. We were arrested a half a dozen times, more days than not, because he had to be on a ladder. So he was up high. You can imagine... Um, <coughs> You know, when you're throwing your stones, right? When you're, there are a lot of situations that we had to get photography of. We wanted to see the action. So we're there. I've got my stones tied and I'm waiting. You know, this is a perfect example of what happens. I, I, I'm, right, I'm waiting to be told to get into the line of the camera and start throwing my stones. I wait and I wait and I look back and there's Bisher on his ladder falling backwards into the arms of two cops. So some <coughs> functionary has decided that there's something wrong with this picture and that if he doesn't arrest us and his commanding officer knows that he was there and didn't arrest us, he's going to lose his job. That's all he knows. He doesn't know anything. We've got official papers, all this kind of stuff, but this guy can't read. You know, he's not paying attention to that. He's worried about his job. That's who arrested us half a dozen times. Because, you know, we're out of place. We're out of sync. We're, what? You know, you, this is the Hodge. What are you doing? You know, you're not supposed to be taking pictures here. Um, but of course we were. And, and uh, the arrest would be followed by <coughs> some one of our group. We wouldn't all be arrested, but some one of our group would go to the uh, police department and explain what was happening and show the paperwork. And then that guy who arrested us would become our guide for the rest of the day, our protector. 
So it was, it was a, you know, perfectly human thing. The guy was afraid to lose his job. And so, you know, we had some challenges that way. Um, on other films, we made another movie there later called Muhammad Legacy of a Prophet. We did quite a bit of filming in Mecca again some years later. And there we had a real problem. This was a faux problem, really. You know, the first one where we were, 1997, we were having a little misunderstanding, you know, with some lower level policemen. But um, the night that we were leaving the airport with all of our footage, and this was Super 16 and 16 millimeter film. Uh, we were stopped at the airport and all the film was confiscated. We'd been there for three, four, five, I don't know. We'd been there for at least two weeks, 10 days filming. We had a lot of film. And we did pull it off. We did get out. We did manage to get our film with us. But they were threatening to develop it all, which would have ruined it. Because at that time, they didn't really have the, you know, the means to do that. Um, it was very dicey. And it was very predictable, you know, because you've got the Ministry of Information, you've got a controlled media, you've got, um, you know, journalists don't have the freedom to say what they like and show what they wish. And we were part of, we were journalists. So, um, so there have been a few challenges along the way, you know, but we've always managed one way or another to, you know, kind of. Well, it, it absolutely turned out very impactful. Um, like I said earlier, you know, even to the point where my college professor was playing it uh, in, in, in my class. And this is at a Jesuit school with, and I'm the only Muslim in the class. And um, yeah, we were really, it was, it was something we were all proud to, to show, to show whoever we could show and, and, and just watch over and over again. So that was, alhamdulillah, really good. But that, you also mentioned that that was your first, now you're, now you're getting into film and, 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 yeah. and yeah. so, so. Yeah, and I, I liked it because it was sociable, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're writing a book is a pretty... Solitary. Solitary, that's mm -hmm. a perfect word. It's a solitary <laughs> exercise, exercise right. and, and effort, and there are joys to it. But it's pretty much you and a piece of paper until you get to the publishing end of it. Right. Um, and filmmaking is the exact opposite. At the end of a movie, there are 150 or 200 credits. And those are just the people who got their name on it, right? You know, there are many more people involved. So it's very social, sociable. So and, did, uh, did somebody come to you and say, let's do this? Or how, how did that actually, how did it go from um, you being more on the writer side of things to actually putting out the legacy of a prophet? Well, well, well this is sort of one of my favorite stories. <laughs> well, I... I mean, I, if you could, because I think like you beautifully raised, like you took us in the direction on which I wanted to go, which was to talk about Unity Productions now. So maybe you can tie that in with the origin story of how that comes together. Yeah. Well, that's what, I'm, that's what I'll do. Lovely. <laughs> because it was, you know, I was on an airplane flying back from uh, Riyadh. And I was there because uh, a UN... Uh, NGO uh, leader of, an, of a UN NGO, um, Japanese guy, uh, wanted to go to Riyadh to something called the Janadaria Festival, which is kind of a cultural festival. And he was to be a speaker there and he wanted to meet some people. And I knew a little bit about, you know, Arabia by then. So he took me with him. I was kind of his guide for a week. And, um, and my reward was an Umrah, which I'd never been on. <laughs> I got to go on Umrah. And flying back from Jeddah to Washington, D.C., I was sitting, before the plane took off, I was sitting next to the, the vice president of a Christian college somewhere in the Middle West, Kansas, Iowa, something like that. And we talked for a few minutes, and he, you know, I was kind of like, what do you do, what do you do? And I told him what I did. And after about five minutes, he said, you know, there's a guy in the back of this plane who should be sitting in this seat. That's what he said to me. So he got up. Wow. And the guy in the back of the plane came forward and sat down next to me, 
And it was my now, after 25 years, filmmaking partner, Alex Gronemer. And he was leading these, uh, this, this group of Christian administrators from different colleges in the Midwest who increasingly were having Muslim Arab students on campus. And he had taken them to Egypt, he had taken them here, he had taken them there. Um, and that's how Alex and I met. And within a year, he had done a TV program on CNN, somewhat similar to what I did with ABC. So here are these two white Muslim, he was Muslim, white Muslim American guys. He's younger than I am, but, you know, sort of in the same general ballpark, um, sitting on a plane uh, for 16 hours, talking about how would you if you were going to try to introduce Muslims to an American audience, what would you do? You know, how, how would you do that? What medium would you use? What, you know, what would go on? So we had a very, you know, fruitful conversation and we stayed in touch on the phone. And toward the end of that flight, we sort of thought, well, you know, we should do something together. We should just do something. And uh, he wound up working for the um, State Department briefly, two years. But in that time, this is before we started working together, he set up the first iftar in the State Department. And then the White House saw it, and he set that one up oh, in the White wow. House, too. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, um, so about a year and a half went by maybe less, and we decided we were going to make a movie. Just all on the phone. He's in Washington, I'm in California. We never met again. Um, but we just talked. And um, he said, you know, <clears throat> I'm working in the State Department now, and I have three kids. And, you know, if this isn't a pipe dream, if it's a real job, just let me know when you put something together, okay? And I said, okay. So I spent the next eight or ten months, mainly in California, in Irvine, in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco, in Palo Alto, talking to people about, well, suppose we made a movie about the profit piece, but how would we, how would we finance that? How would we pull that off? I know a guy who could help us make the movie, and he works for PBS, and I have Alex, and I have a couple, I mean, we could put together a team but, you know, it's a job. What are, how do we do this? And then, then making the movie itself is expensive. These things don't grow on trees. And I, I, cre I put together a network of about two dozen people who were business people, uh, who were Muslim. And um, at one point, um, I was at Salam Qureshi's house. If you know that name, you know that Salam has been, over the years, instrumental in putting together a number of things that we think of now as, oh, they must have been here forever, but they weren't, you know. And um, so I'm at his house, and there's been some kind of a annual meeting of big cheeses, you know, in the, in the <laughs> industry, right? And, and then they meet at his house later for a little party, I guess. And I'm there with, I've got a, he told me, bring, bring something you can hand out. I'm so stupid, I don't even know, you know, how to, I don't know what I'm doing really, except I'm good with people a one to one. So I brought a little piece of paper, it might have been that big, maybe it was five by 10. It was like a half a piece of eight by 10 paper, something like that. And on it, it had a few sentences about this movie of being a, a literally a biography of the Prophet Muhammad that would be also be about Muslims in America. We'd somehow try to show modern Muslims walking in the footsteps of the Prophet. That was the idea. And one of the people at the evening, it was actually an afternoon, said, put me down for 10%. And I just looked back at him and I said, 10% of what? And he said, 10% of whatever it costs. 
and we were off and running. We had a, we had, we, you know, it just put um, a floor underneath our fantasies. So, I mean, I was in the Bay Area at the time when, I, um, at least a, it felt like six plus months prior to actually coming coming on the air, and there was a lot of noise and excitement for sure at where, whether it's mosques or potentially even people's houses, I can't recall, but um, it was something that there was, there was a, um, there was a lead up to it. Right. Well, yeah. So, yeah, we were, we were making the movie for 18 months during the week and on the weekends we would go out and raise more money. Yeah. So, so the movie comes out in 2002, but is, uh, was the idea before nine 11? Yes. Nine 11. It's a very good question. Because the chronology <clears throat> was critical. Yeah, because I, made, I feel like that plane had, ride must yeah, have occurred. We had made two-thirds yeah. of the movie. And we were sitting on a couch at uh, the Kika Media, the, uh, the guy that was helping us turn this into a movie, uh, very early in the morning, as we did. And somebody called up and said, turn on the TV. And for, I would say, a week we thought that this movie was toast. You know, we would, this movie would never be finished. No one would finance it. And if it were, it would never be broadcast. That's just what, you know. And then we came out of our shock. because Everybody was shocked that such a thing could happen. And one of us, and I, honestly none of us remembers who, but somebody said, no, you know, it's the other way around. This movie is more important than ever. And we all kind of said, yeah, that's true, you know. If, if anybody is ever going to know anything about Muslims besides that building and those planes, then it's going to be this movie because it's the Prophet Muhammad, you know. I mean, what better vehicle, you know, how to show people being people who happen to be Muslims and happen to be Americans. Um, so we went back, we found a, uh, fireman. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we so, found... So had you already, because that, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. Had you already begun talking with American Muslims? Oh, that yeah. had already oh, happened yeah. pre-9-11. Big, Big time. Every time, every time there was an event of size in the prophet's, peace be upon him, in the prophet's life, there would be, we would, we would, a big mosque was being built in Michigan, in Dearborn, at this time, right? Islamic and the people Center were of baking America. bread to raise the money. We went there and filmed the whole thing, you know, the, with the building of this mosque. I mean, it wound up being 10 minutes of the film, but it was, but it was from the building of the mosque in Medina to Dearborn, right? So all the way through, that was the way it was. We just, we just wound the 7th century story around the twenty almost first century story. I, I would be remiss, and I'm, I, I feel like I'm going to forget later. Um, past guest of the show, Najah Bazi, uh, we've had her on the show. Yeah. Um, yeah. We were actually in Michigan recording with her. Yeah. So um, I just want to mention that. So yeah. shout out to Najah. Najah Bazi, the nurse who, Correct. Who, who, who really demonstrates what Muslim compassion is all about. Right. Not yeah. to mention all of the scholars. We've had several of the sort of scholars you deal with, like you also speak with. Um, but how did that come together? I mean, like you have Sheikh Hamza on, I think maybe Sherman Jackson. One by one. Yeah. So, so, no, but you had already sort of identified a list of people that you wanted to get on. Yes, tape. we did. We added to that list after 9-11. Sharif Bassioni, the Nobel uh, prize nominee for, in peace. The late. We add the late uh, Sharif Bassioni. Yeah. We added him. He was a and law we professor. We added the fireman. Um, you know, um, I mean, we needed to, it was very tricky, you know, because we're talking about one of the most horrible expressions of what? Not Islam, you know, of terrorism. Um, you know, big time. Uh, I remember uh, John Esposito saying to me, this is going to set the Muslim community back a hundred years. You know, days after 9-11. So there was this this feeling of, uh, we've got to do something, you know. And Bassioni was perfect, you know, because he, he had been through lots of problematic situations. And he was a, he was a brilliant 
uh, lawyer and a, and a great interpreter of peace. Uh, and he could tie uh, Islam and the story of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, all of that whole story, the whole foundational story, into uh, uh, modern efforts to keep, to make and keep peace. I, I, I applied to DePaul University Law School. Unfortunately, I didn't yeah. get in, but I applied just for him, yeah. just for him, because yeah. uh, he was alive, yeah. mashallah, at my the time. My father went to mm -hmm. that school. Yeah. He went so to, who, who, my father went to that law oh, school. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been even a smaller, right? <laughs> yeah, another regret not going to the law school. <laughs> yeah. That's Your father's weird. alma mater. So, yeah, I mean, so the, it was obviously very well received. People were very excited, but I think, I think it had quite the impact. Um, and of course, out of Unity Productions came so many more films, right? Yeah. Are there any you want to um, just share your experiences, Bill? I know there is Prince, Prince Among Slaves and, and just so many more. Well, which, the, the which were some the of your important highlights? part of all of this for me, personally, is that just as I needed to go to Mecca to learn how to be a Muslim, Every one of these films, you know, has been like this gigantic learning experience for me. You know, the, 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 I, I mean, this is how I have managed to, I'll never be, I'll never catch up. You know, I didn't become a Muslim until I was 41 years old. I'll never catch up. But, but you know, this has been a way for me to learn more. You know, I mean, um, I now... Um, looking at uh, the story of Malcolm X and his sister, Ella Collins. Well, I mean, here is, a, here is a story. All of the stories that we have told, we've made almost 15 films now, you know. Every story that we've told is a story that was turned upside down by American media or Western media or just people's crazy thinking, you know. And what, all we've been trying to do is just turn them back up, put them back on their feet. You know, and, and it started with the prophet. It went through, you know, where did Muslims, Muslims have been in the United States for hundreds of years. You know, what is this business about? They just got here and you can't trust them. You know, they built this country. So all of that, you know, all of that, all of those kinds of stories, the Malcolm X story, you know, I mean, this man was a hero, vilified, you know, his story is still misunderstood. Everybody's terrified. You mention his name, you know, it's kind of scary. He's got a scary guy. Do you have a personal favorite uh, amongst all the 15? Well, I do like um, the one, The Prince Among Slaves. Uh, you know, I was sitting on a green couch, just like I'm sitting on right now, when I read that book. It took me three days, and I knew about halfway through this is going to be a great movie. You know, mm -hmm. just a. And then. It turned out that Terry Alford, who wrote the book, lived 11 miles from Alex's house in Virginia, in, in Maryland. Mm -hmm. So we just made, every time we make a movie, we make connections with people, Sharif Bassioni, you know, people who have been thinking about these things all their lives. It's not our ideas, you know. We try to find people who really have done the work and then relax them enough so that they can you know, tell in a personable way uh, millions of people what they know. You know? So, yeah. I mean, I, I want to do justice. And, and at the same time, I mean, I wish we could spend as much time talking about every one of those films as we did Muhammad, the Legacy of the Prophet. But um, I think just for the sake of time, I, I do want to get to also your latest project, which, you know, as our listeners know, I mean, sort of, led to this conversation happening because, um, you know, you, I think, listened to the podcast with Mona and Sebastian. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear that um, story about how that, the idea for this project came together well, from it's a your good perspective. One. It's, a, it's a good one to focus on because it is, strange as it may sound, um, it comes out of the same impetus as the first film, you know, showing... <clears throat> Showing Muslim roots in America, you know, I mean, uh, the legacy of a prophet wrapped that reality uh, around the foundational story of Islam. This wraps immigration and American Islam, American Muslims, around Route 66, which is so unlikely in most people's 
minds, that's not something most people put together. So that's good. It makes people say, oh, I didn't know that. You know, that's what you want. Um, you want an audience that is um, curious, mm -hmm. right? They're just suddenly all, what? You know, the Muslim American, the great Muslim American road trip? What has that got to do with Route 66? Well, listen to this, you know. It turns out that there's a big immigration story around that road. Um, you know, that it's not just about Nat King Cole and his song, although it's about that too, you know. But um, so... Uh, migration obviously being you know, centered yeah. on that route. You yeah. know, we talked about it last time with Sebastian and actually your first episode talks about it because it's, it's Grapes of Wrath. It's, it's, uh, 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 Kerouac's book on the road. On the road. Yeah. Jack yeah. Kerouac's book. And we tried to, you know, shoehorn some literature in there. You know, I always try to do that. <laughs> um, so we had, uh, it, it's remarkable. I mean, I haven't even thought about this before you mentioned it, but, or uh, knowing so much about your story now, um, it, it brings together so many elements to your story, I think, very beautifully, because traveling, journeying, you know, is such an, it has been such an integral part of your life. And so I think this documentary just beautifully captures that, although yeah, you're not the protagonist of the story, yeah. per se, but uh, it's a bunch of maybe millennial slash Gen, Gen Xers. Um, <laughs> I, in fact, I think Mona is the millennial and, and Sebastian is the Gen Xer. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, um, yeah I, I find that fascinating because it, it, it very much, in many ways it's, it's, it's your story. Well, it was the most fun I've ever had making a movie. I'll say that, you know. Wow. Um, my... my um, sense of Route 66 has been changed forever. And I've been on that road a few times, but right. I had no idea. Of, again, you know, these are like opportunities for me to learn as well, you know. Um, I had no idea that, uh, uh, well, you know, that a Syrian camel tear was hired, uh, uh, you know, before the Civil War, who wound up, uh, you know, not necessarily creating a camel corps, which was the original idea, but who wound up uh, then surveying a road which became Route 66, the last third of it. Ha -ha -ha what are the chances of that? And he was a Muslim convert, Haji Ali. Haji you know? Ali. Yeah. And Dr. Amr talks about the, I think there's a song in the Marine Corps, um, Hi Jolly. And, and that's a derivative of his name. That's right. Haji Ali. Haji Ali. Yeah. Haji Ali. Mm -hmm. And honestly, 30 years ago, I read the story of Haji Ali because I went to Death Valley. And there's a little $2 paperback about Haji Ali, you know, that you learn. He was a, I mean, you learn about who he was. Is that where his monument is? Like, I, I, no, I believe there's a statue. It's, a, it's in Quartzsite, Arizona. But, in, but he hung Road in Death Valley. He was in Death Valley for a long time. There was a... I mean, a lot we couldn't say, but we didn't have time. But he was admired by and a great friend with a millionaire named Death Valley Scotty, who left his Chicago palace mansion, whatever, because he had asthma, and built another palace mansion in Death Valley. Um, and... He and Haji Ali just hit it off. Haji Ali, you know, Haji Ali was a prospector in Death Valley for decades, you know. So he would just pitch up at this mansion and, you know, have a good meal and tell, tell a few stories. And Death Valley Scotty was quite a guy. So there are all these stories about Haji Ali. But, you know, they go back uh, further than that and they come forward in great numbers, the number of. Arab Americans from the 1860s on, big numbers, both Christian and Muslim. And there are just so many um, facts that we can reveal um, with the, this couple who are on a kind of second honeymoon, you know. It's kind of very laissez-faire, you know, just kind of what you see is what you get and... Uh, who you bump into is what you learn. It's very easy on the eye and easy on the brain, but you wind up learning a lot. So that was our object. And uh, 
I just watched the last one, what, Tuesday night. You know, it's pretty pretty much fun to watch here. Watch your movie on TV you know, after 18 months of, you know. I'm a little behind, but I'm, I'm doing that intentionally because I want to binge watch the rest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. In well, today's it, age of binge watching. It's, yeah. uh, it's streaming. It's streamable. Yeah, yeah. Nobody right. I, I'm very bad about watching things when they're broadcast. Live. I almost never can pull it. How can somebody who hasn't had a chance to see the catalog, um, you know, through the years, how can they go back and watch the entire catalog? They're Is there, all available on uh www.upf.tv Unity Productions Foundation so upf.tv I'd, I'd be remiss um, if I didn't ask about so because you've talked about and, and, and if Alex is listening, you know, this is the, or, you know, we always talk about origin story. This is the sort of Justice League Avengers uh, <laughs> origin story. You, Alex, meeting on an airplane. Um, but I have to ask about how you uh, and, and Jawad, the two of you meet with Jawad Abdurrahman. Um, uh, old Alex, friend, Alex, long-time listener. Alex <laughs> discovered Jawad. Okay. Um, and introduced him to me. Was that before uh, Astro or No, he was, okay. he was he, uh, Jawad. Abdurrahman, uh, a Cincinnati boy, as I am, That's right. although we had never met. Um, his dad is a doctor. Um, uh, you know, Jawad came along pretty early in the formation of UPF, and he's just so skillful. You know, I mean, he can make a movie. He can talk about a movie. He can bring people together around projects with real brilliance. So he's a lot of fun to work with. I like him a lot. Um, and um, Jawad is younger than I am, younger than Alex. But not, you know, I mean, I don't know. He has kids, he lives in Virginia. Uh, we have an office that's just manned by him and his staff, sort of. He's the development side of the... But he's also an executive producer. He's a jack of many trades, you know. Um and uh, I would say, I mean, he and I work together all the time. You know, he's always got fresh ideas. Other than the Malcolm X project, is there anything you can uh, give us a glimpse into? Um, well, the Malcolm, X, the Malcolm X project isn't the Malcolm X project. It's that we're, we'll, we're I'm just reading now. Hmm. I'm trying to feel my way into the next, what's the next project to be? And I don't do this alone. Alex and I do it together. We always do these things together. Hmm. And, you know, when you're, when you're, I mean, if your object is what our object is, and there are many different ways of making movies and different kinds of movies to make, but our object is to get a story that millions of people can benefit from, a story that can be broadcast nationally, which is a big hurdle, um, and a story that we can finance because this isn't cheap, you know. I mean, if you're if you're going to try to get a national broadcast, you're talking about production values that cost money, right? More than hmm. uh, independent films. Everything's got to be just so. And it's not just PBS. We've we've done films for other broadcasting, but you know, there's a certain yeah. quality. I guess you're quote unquote. Um, uh, so you, so those are the three defining characteristics, right? And you have to love it enough to stick with it for two, three years, right? Um, that's the that's the other thing. So it isn't simple, you know, to come up with. I know we have lots of projects. We have people who bring us projects we've never made somebody else's idea because of that last part. You got to love it. it. It almost has to come out of. Right, you know, yeah. out of your core, rather than be brought to you. Yeah. At least the sort of films we're, we're doing. For sure, it has to speak to you. Um, you know, um, so uh, the, um, I, I guess I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you could indulge us, I mean, we have, we, you know, um, I think it would be a great way to sort of bookend the show in a way because we talk about some of your earliest inspiration. But um, if there's a particular piece of poetry that you might indulge us with is there something that you could quickly uh read read sure. from yeah, yeah if you don't mind i just happen to have a few there <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was not planned by the way I, I did not know that actually but, i um 
I wasn't sure if it was going to be, you know, verbate, like something from memory or there's, something written. There's so many poems. That I've written so many poems. Some of them are much better than others. Some of them are really terrible. Um, but, you know, you just keep trying. Um, well, we talked a lot about the Hodge. I managed to write one poem about the Hodge. Um, so why don't I read that one? Because it, you know, makes sense. So I met a guy in L.A. who told me a story about his grandfather's Hodge in 1939. He told me what it was like and the stories that his grandfather told him. And I was so moved. I thought, God, you know, if I could capture that somehow, what he told me, just capture the story. Because he told me the story of, um, you know, they're riding on horseback, they're covered in flowers, garlands of flowers. People are throwing flowers at them as they move out of town and head toward the train station. They're in some little town, they're going to connect with the great trunk road and finally get to the boat and get on the boat and go to from India, right? So what, I mean, this was, this was like another world. And, and those stories from Thousand Roads to Mecca um, really appealed to me that way. You know, there were stories about the Hajj, but they were from another world. This guy's story was like that too. You know, really, really something. So I just pretty much put together what he told me um, in, in this poem. Um, I mean, I turned it into poetry. He was just telling me a story. But, you know, he, he let me understand that it wasn't easy, you know, that um, there, was, there was a real camaraderie, but also a lot of danger and death. And, uh, and how did that, it, he had a way of putting it that made me, helped me to understand how um, we are on a journey here. We are on a pilgrimage here, whether we're going on a pilgrimage or not. We're on a pilgrimage. And um, there, there comes a time when you reach your goal. And how do we hold that? We're also afraid of dying. And yet, here are these hajis who are doing this, risking their lives. Um, this is a long time ago. So... Um, they're risking their lives even more. You know, we get on an airplane and fly to Mecca and get in a hotel and we're happy if we can perform our rights correctly. But these are people who spent months, you know, with very little money that they had saved what they had for years. Their little entire bits lives. Of, little bits yeah. of money, you know, right. from that they could put aside from the rice and the beans that, you know, they really needed the money for. So this is called An India A Go. And India go. That's the time because it's not now, you know. And um, the town that they're coming from is Bantwa. And um, and the guy who told me the story was Hassan Haroon, just a beautiful man. So so this is just a picture. You know, it's a picture of they're leaving their home, they're getting on the train, they're going on Hajj, they're getting to Mecca. It's a very simple narrative, and I'm just painting the picture. And it's a little long because I was having fun, but it's not that long. Oh, where's the last part? Hmm. Before I start, I want to be sure I can finish. Well, I mean, yeah. And, and you got me thinking about this. My grandmother telling me that she went on a boat, and, and she actually, I, was, I believe she did it also on behalf of her mother. I'm going to have to go back now and, and ask, ask my, family, my parents the story, but you, kinda, you definitely got me thinking uh, about those, just all those stories that we hear we don't always pay attention to, right? Uh, and, and Omar talked about his grandmother, I mean, but even in, in the lifetime of our parents, um, the only way to go to Hajj from, from India uh, or the subcontinent was by boat. Uh, yeah. And my father's first Hajj, I mean, it wouldn't have, he, it wouldn't have counted for him, but he was uh, eight years old and he went with his parents. And uh, um, there's a story of him, and this is a story, this is one of my earliest memories of hearing this story, uh, about him getting lost on the ship. 
and yeah. they found him um, two days later. No way. Yeah, he was lost on the ship. Well, not maybe. I think it was like a day, like a day, I, day and a half later. Was it must have been a large ship then? It was a large, yeah, like a jahaz, like as we would say in Urdu. So yeah. it's like a large ship that usually they would leave from the port of Bombay. Yeah. So people from all over India, like you mentioned, I think in this poetry, the the, the poem alludes to or will, um, they would journey to Bombay, and how you got there was up to mm. you. You mm. get to Bombay, and then um, that's how you take the ship, the mm. boat. And there's I think there's only like a number of boats that would go every year. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. And my got, father got lost. That's amazing. I, I actually got lost in Mecca as a kid, so that's a whole other story. Oh, I, I, I held on to the wrong abaya, so but for, for about probably for about forty five minutes to an hour. But wow. I have an image in my head of uh, of crying. <laughs> wow, <laughs> so I got found. Wow. but that's another story. But please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad you, uh, yeah, because you, no, you, these you just experiences like Hassan told me, the yeah. same kind of story. Well, you yeah. conjured two memories that both yeah. of us had. I didn't know about yeah. this memory of Omar's yeah. getting lost. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Well, that's what poetry does. That's know? right. It does. So. And you mentioned, you know, something you mentioned earlier. I'm sorry. I, like, I, I had to say this, like the idea of you said that like the traveler and we've talked a lot about journeying and trips and travel, but the idea of like life being a, a journey and, and and, and we all being travelers, not only does it come from hadith, but, you know, the idea of the suluk or the salik, the traveler and the journey and, and the road, if you will, mm -hmm. are both so integral to our tradition. So, Absolutely. yeah, thank Absolutely. you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. The caravans arrive. Rumi. And Rumi, come um, as you are. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's an image that, you know, really plays all the way through all the great poets. So it's we are not Persian, a caravan. Yeah, we are not a caravan of despair. Yeah, I, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so here they are, the pilgrims, and they're moving, they're leaving town to start with. And they've got these garlands around them, uh, weighed down with autumn garlands. The pilgrims glide on horseback past our door, bidding the neighborhood goodbye, cool tears brimming on their eyelids. Old couples under parasols. They've signed their wills. Some won't be coming back. They're bound from Mecca to greet the shrine and keep a rendezvous with Allah. Trumpets, roses, rice grains rain down on their saddles as they pass. Beyond the gates, the cheering fades. The sun-baked plane takes over. They'll board a train tonight on the Bombay Road. They won't mind wooden seats in a third-class carriage. They've known each other since childhood. Wed young to distant kin, they have each other, as silver limbs have leaves on trees in those mogul paintings, small as playing cards, or a sultan's picnic centuries ago. Though fortunate in all of this and feeling blessed, some will meet their end before they get there, breathing their last on choppy seas and a freighter bound for Jeddah, or slake their thirst from stagnant streams and reaching Mecca fevered lie at dawn in some stranger's tent, faint breath clouding a small mirror, or later come to grief on the long way home. It doesn't matter. Made whole, by what saddens us, they take their leave together, departing in a way that makes them glad. Yeah, so you know. Thank you. That was that was that was really beautiful. Um, thank you so much for indulging me and uh, <laughs> indulging us. I should say. I know I kind of put you on the spot, but. Uh, um, it, there, there's just so much. I mean, we could literally spend hours together. So um, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> one day, one day. I, I would uh, like to hear more this, of your stories. This will be this will be the first part, and okay. and we'll have Chapter you back. One. Yeah, that's right. Chapter <laughs> one with Michael Wolf. We'll have you back on, and and uh, we also want to have Alex on. So I know you'll put in a good word for without us. Even, without I mean, joke joking aside, yeah. I mean to be honest, we could have you every time you do a. a <laughs> Uh, show, uh, a new PBS film or whatever it is that like that's great. a conversation that <laughs> just it, double clicking yeah. as I'd like yeah. to say into that topic right for yeah. sure for sure but I, I don't want to say that uh, the, the reason I avoided saying that was because <laughs> it might be two three years between this project <laughs> and the next so I want to have you on before then inshallah uh, inshallah well but, it's uh, been uh, terrific thank you very much no we were so privileged and honored yeah I, I love doing this and so 
Um, thank you so much, um, you know, on behalf of our listeners, on behalf of Omar, uh, we want to thank you for sharing such a beautiful part of your life with us. And uh, we want to, you know, capture it for posterity's sake. Um, for, the, for our listeners, as always, thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, if you have thoughts, feedback, etc., please hit us up on um, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can email us or check us out on social media. Um, please do leave a star rating. Every little bit counts. Uh, and, uh, if you check want out, to check out the, check out the, uh, the, ba- the, the backlog, uh, on, at UPF.TV, www.upf.tv. There's just an amazing, um, diverse list of, of films. I've seen a good number of them. Some of them, I, I remember being actually really moved like Prince Among Slaves. So for the listeners, go, go check those out. Well, thank you for listening and catch us next time on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thank mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm.